This is uh, the session on uh, yeah, yeah. on winter survival in canola. We have four speakers, and we'll we'll, we'll they'll, they're going to try and make presentations of like ten minutes each or so to give us uh, time to have a little gr uh, group questioning. Um, but uh, you know, if you want to, if you have a question you want to ask of the speaker af right after he speaks, you can go ahead and ask it. So. Our, our uh, first speaker is uh, Bill Pan, who you met this morning, Crop and Soil Sciences professor at WSU. Um, and is this your? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Bill. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, it was an interesting uh, group of email exchanges coming coming into this session. A lot of uh, admittance that well, we really don't know what what's going on with winter survival all the time and it remains somewhat of a mystery but I think uh, there's a wealth of experience sitting there at the table so I think we're going to learn some things and my uh, my contribution to this will be I'll, I'll just uh, set the table a little bit on on this and uh, present some some data that's relevant to what are what the subsequent speakers will be referring to so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, water use, particularly with uh, the latest trend of looking at earlier and earlier uh, seeding of winter canola to try to capture that surface moisture to get the crop up and growing. And then uh, asking the question, well, what's the trade-off of water use versus uh, survival? And, uh, oh, okay. Thank you. And uh, so I'll be, I'll be talking about some data that Megan Reese and Lauren Young have collected, Dennis Rowe, and some of Frank Young's and Bill Schillinger's plots. So just to start out with, this is more from uh, Canola 101, I guess, uh, just to emphasize when uh, Mike Stone was talking about trying to breed for more prost prostrate uh, growth habits of winter canola that this all stems from the fact that um, canola being a dicotyledonous plant pushes its cotyledon up through the surface and then the act, most of the active growing points of the shoot, shoot or, uh, or the shoot meristems are actually above ground as opposed to our wheat that we well, well know the, the shoot meristems are actually uh, protected beneath the ground and and so that's a major difference um, the second major difference is that um, canola starts out or uh, most of these broadleaf oil seeds uh, start out with a single tap root versus the many seminal axes roots that emanate from the the wheat seed and and subsequent uh, seedlings so Basic difference in both shoot and root morphology lead to greater sensitivity of the oil seed uh, seedling. And so thinking about the, the aerial environment versus the soil environment, I'm gonna now present some, uh, oh, I got a little um, labeling of those. And uh, so, so thinking about above ground versus just below the surface and looking at some uh, temperatures and, and it was uh, alluded to earlier how the 13, 14 season, winter season was uh, pretty severe on, on winter canola. And, and so here's uh, two temperature graphs uh, between, let's see, October, and into the next March, April, uh, looking at the minimum temperatures at the four inch depth, um, or let's see, yeah, four inch depth, the blue line, versus the uh, right at the soil surface or right above the soil. And you can see the temperature differences between those two environments and, and how you can obviously think right away, okay, well, that's one big advantage of, of winter, 
of winter wheat is that it's got its meristems in that much uh, warmer insulated soil environment compared to uh, the cold aerial temperature just above the soil surface. And so in a year where we had, uh, uh, I think uh, Lauren said it best, that no matter what, <laughs> what approach, what management approach, what variety was planted, whatever, at, uh, at Ralston that just about everything was toast. And uh, the temperature, minimum temperatures, you can see two minimum spikes there occurring uh, and mentioning the below zero temperatures really kind of being a key. And if they happen very rapidly, that's another key factor that there's not much time for acclimation of that, that shoot tissue. Okay, the same thing happened at, at Dusty. Um, we had a little bit of a landscape effect and unfortunately our plots were all <laughs> located in the lower part of the landscape and there was some settling of cold air and so again we had, had uh, some events where we had near zero or sub-zero temperatures uh, right above the, the soil surface where that, those shoot mirror stems are trying to survive. Um, some, some early seeding work that uh, Bill Schillinger attempted at, at Dray's farm, uh, following up on, on this whole notion that, well, how far can you push back these uh, winter uh, plantings of winter canola and went, went back uh, so boldly as to go to June 10th and plant winter canola when there was good surface moisture and two plantings in June followed by a couple in August. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the results that uh, Megan Reese collected here showing um, the average water use for those crops um, uh, in the bar, blue bars, showing uh, uh, seven to eight and a half inches of soil water use by, by that early crop. So you get nice lush growth, a big fat plant that you think, well, okay, that's gonna, that surely is gonna make it through the winter. Uh, in comparison to the August plantings, less water use, smaller plants, but better survival as indicated by the, the orange line there. So kind of an inverse correlation between the size of the plants and how much water was used. So then you ask the question, well, are, do you actually uh, create water stress plants by the time comes around to going into the winter. And uh, I think Megan said that there were about uh, a little less than 13 inches of total soil moisture in the six foot profile and the plants had used uh, seven to eight and a half, eight uh, inches of that. Okay. And then, uh, <clears throat> then uh, kind of another notion is that, well, uh, uh, again, going back to Mike Stom's comment this morning, well, does stock height have to do with it? Uh, something with uh, survival, and if it's a tall plant, the shoot uh, meristems are poking up further from the ground, further away from that insulated area. Uh, maybe uh, if you get a little bit of snow cover, you don't even cover all the, the meristems if you've got a real tall plant. And again, um, uh, the taller plants uh, were, were correlated to less winter survival. So uh, comparing those temperature profiles to a good survival year of 2011-2012, uh, you can see here all of the minimum temperatures at the soil surface were still well above zero. So that's kind of the bracketing set of temperature uh, ranges that we're, we're kind of looking at for these events of, of survival versus no survival. Uh, we started looking at potential for using KCL as a fertilizer to uh, go off of this idea that you can load a plant up with soluble salts and if you uh, add soluble salts to a solution, you, you fr uh, lower the freezing point. It's kind of the same way as using road salt to melt the icy road. 
uh, same concept. And uh, so we try to load up canola plants with KCL top dressed on uh, several growers fields over several years. Uh, seemed like a good concept that we kind of proved in the lab in the green growth chamber, but well, we could never make it work in the field. So whether the temperatures were just overwhelming that effect or exactly what was going on, we weren't real successful with that. So that's about all I've got, um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more perspectives on that from, from our next speakers, but I did want to thank uh, all the growers that have, have provided fields, dead or alive, <laughs> over the years that we've looked at. Thanks. All right, next speaker is Jim Davis from U of I. Jim's an expert in all things Braska. He's been with the, the U of I breeding program for like 20 years or something, right? Something so, like that, yeah, yes. So. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some early planting date work that we've done in winter canola, um, primarily in eastern Washington and northern Idaho. So a little more moisture than what, we, what, what Bill had seen uh, near Ralston and Ritzville, a little more moisture than, than what, what you would see over in the Mansfield area. So it makes the story a little bit different. Now I just need to get the mouse on the correct button. Okay, so basically there's two keys to having a successful winter canola crop, or two very important keys, uh, and that is getting the crop established and then getting it to survive the winter. And so we've got to obviously start with, with, with establishment first, and the key to that is moisture, and, getting the, and then the key to winter survival is getting the plant large enough uh, that it'll have some winter hardiness. Um, typically, what we're looking at, we did some growth chamber studies, and we need about 300 growing degree days to get the plant to be big enough where we can start thinking about it being big enough to survive the winter. And so, and that's based on, you know, growing degree days above four, four degrees C. And so depending on where you're at, you can work backwards to find what your latest planting date is. But in general, it's going to be, you know, the end of August, maybe the 5th of September in some of the areas that have a little longer fall. The problem we have is with those limiting moisture conditions is sometimes we get a field that looks like this. Can you guys see that? No. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how to get there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Um, Okay, so we've got enough plants to make a crop in this particular situation, and, and they'll fill in most of those gaps, but we're going to have issues with weeds here. And, and so this is one of those situations where, well, it's not thin enough to replant, but it's too thin to be, you know, what, what we'd like. And so there's a number of different approaches that we can take. Um, and I, yes, and so one of them might be in the drier wheat fallow areas to go with a deep furrow drill to get that dry soil out of the way uh, and actually, you know, get the seed down in the moisture so it'll come up and establish. Um, another approach that works really well is irrigation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and originally I, I had the slide titled, Irrigation Makes It Easy. But I think the irrigated growers would, would argue with me that it's still not easy. Um, but at least you can pre-irrigate, you can get good soil moisture, so you can plant into moisture and establish the crop. We were doing some forage work and, and, and planting it earlier in the spring on purpose to get some forage. And we realized, well, these plants get really big, they establish really well, because we've got lots of moisture in the fallow if you plant it earlier in the summer and so establishment is a bit easier. However, uh, some varieties will flower when you plant them in June or even July, and when they do that, that's going to, to pretty much negate any winter hardiness that they might have. Uh, in this particular picture on your left there, that's spring canola, and this winter canola was planted like within a couple weeks of the, of the spring canola. But as you can see, most of the varieties don't flower. Uh, this is what it looked like the next spring, uh, and you can see that this is actually a different spot in the trial, but the fl those plants that bolted are pretty much dead. 
Uh, the ones on your left that were more compact have survived the winter fairly well. Uh, on the right, you can just see a plot peeking out there that had kind of higher growing points. The stem kind of elongated. It didn't actually flower. Uh, and that's going to cause some problems when you have a uh, little colder temperatures. Uh, these pictures are in Moscow, by the way, these recent ones. Uh, but under those conditions, we see a lot of difference between varieties as far as winter hardiness goes. Uh, this is an example of where we were, we were looking at a fairly extreme early planting date, uh, about June 15th, because we really wanted to test these varieties to see which ones <coughs> had the best winter survival. Uh, and this was uh, last summer, so this would have been taken in, you know, early June of 2014. Uh, here's a variety that the stems elongated a bit more, didn't have as good a winter survival. And so there's, there's going to be these, vari these varietal differences. Uh, this is another problem we encountered. You can see, you know, the, uh, where we had trouble with the dry uh, soils, getting the crop established there in the, uh, along, the, along the hilltop. But those plants look pretty rough, and if you look a little closer, um, they've been almost devoured by flea beetles. And so insects can be a big problem with early planted winter canola, and even with traditional planted winter, winter canola. So the flea beetles are just crazy there. They're usually not this thick, but we had an excellent crop of them that year. And we can also have some severe problems with aphids. And so we were wondering how important it is to control these insects. And so we did some uh, looking at uh, insecticide applications, uh, seed treatment, foliar, and then combination of, of seed and, and foliar. And the first row of numbers there that's labeled control is just a score on a scale of one to nine, where nine would be no damage and one would be pretty much dead plants. And so you can see if we didn't treat with any insecticide, you know, we've got practically dead plants. Uh, a seed treatment or a foliar application gave us pretty good control, but when we combined the seed treatment and foliar application, we got really good control. But when you look at the yields, it didn't make any difference. And so what's happened, and what happened in, in this case in 2011, if you looked at the plots, you know, even from a quarter of a mile away, you could pick out the plots that weren't treated with insecticide because they were basically yellow, white, like that previous picture I showed, because they, they had been com almost completely def defoliated. Uh, however, we got good fall rains in Moscow, and the plants were able to regrow and acclimate on a nice fall where the temperatures went, went down gradually and so the plants were recovered by the time winter came. However, I couldn't in good conscience tell people not to control their insects and we kept trying year after year to do this trial. So we, we, we did it for four years and you can see that for the first three years, even though yields varied quite a bit from year to year, it didn't make any difference whether we controlled the insects or not. Then 2014 came, we had a dry fall, and we had those really hard freezes in December, and the plants weren't able to acclimate, they weren't able to recover from this insect damage, and now we're looking where we are seeing the differences, uh, what the insect stress is doing to the plant's winter hardiness when they don't have a chance to, re chance to recover. Um, so we saw some pretty serious yield reductions on those plants where we didn't have have the insecticide. So even though it's not necessarily every year where you have a little higher rainfall zone, we're still going to advise people that they want to control their insects. So what date should you actually plant the canola for, for, for optimum? And this goes along with the stuff that, that Bill showed. Um, we did a trial over several years with four different cult cultivars. Um, we had, initially, we had four sites, Moscow and Lewis and Idaho, Pendleton, Oregon, and Kalispell, Montana. Uh, three planting dates, kind of an intermediate to high seeding rate. Uh, and then we also looked at soil moisture. And then we continued the study uh, two years later. Uh, we lost the Montana site because stuff, it just didn't survive the winter there consistently, no matter when you planted it, it was too cold. Uh, and, and we went to La Crosse or Dusty Washington instead of Lewiston. Uh, just because we were able to get into a canola field there. <coughs> so
So this is what the crop looks like in September uh, at different planting dates. So the late June and late July, they're pretty big leafy plants. There's lots of stuff there for bugs to eat, but um, this particular year, it didn't look too bad, even though we had yield differences. Uh, these were actually, we did control the insects on these um, planting date studies. Um, late August, a more traditional planting date, the plants are a bit smaller. Uh, and, and those late August plants there, that's what I would consider an optimum size for winter survival. Just to compare to a mid September planting date in Moscow, this is about the minimum size you're going to want your plants going into the winter. Uh, and, and these survive just fine. This was not part of the study, but just, just to show you what things look like. So this is the study of the next summer. Uh, this would be 2014. Uh, and so interestingly enough, the size is reversed, at least in height. Um, I don't have a good explanation for that, but those bigger plants we planted in late June are actually shorter. Some years they were all the same height, uh, but conditions, I think actually what happened here, we saw more winter damage in the late June, so they were a little hard, they had a little more trouble getting going in the spring, and so that, that set them back a little bit. Uh, if we look at moisture use, so, so this, this is the percent moisture on the three, three different years um, at the planting date. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Soil moisture in October. So, so obviously the early planting dates there in June, uh, there was less moisture left by October than the August planting date, which matches just up with what, what Bill, Bill has seen. Uh, but in our case, we didn't actually ever run out of moisture. Uh, and so the crops were able to survive into the fall, whereas some of the work that uh, the WSU guys have done in the drier climates, they actually ran out of moisture before fall and the plants died. Uh, and I've seen that happen in Idaho in one situation where we had some really high clay soils. Uh, there were some patches in the field that died because they ran out of moisture. Uh, so this picture was taking, taken uh, in January of 2014. Uh, at Dusty, and you can see the plants are hammered pretty hard, but they weren't completely dead. If you got down and looked in there, uh, especially the, the intermediate and late planting dates, they had still survived, but then we had another hard freeze in February when the ground was waterlogged, and that pretty much did them in at this site. It killed all the planting dates. Um, but this is a close look at, at where you see some of the survival down along the crown of the plant uh, in this same field. And then this back at Moscow, uh, this main stem actually was killed during the winter, but the crown survived and so the plant can regrow from these buds that, that are on, on the side of the stem. And so this regrowing process is kind of what slows them down a bit. Uh, and why we saw them, the early planting dates a bit shorter. Uh, this is a, a field of canola that was planted in, in June near Moscow uh, and then grazed in the fall. Um, and, and because we had some good moisture in the fall, you know, it was a, a, able to regrow af after grazing and, and survive quite well. Of course, the grazing also kept the growing points closer to the ground. And so the final thing that we're, and the most important thing is really how things yield. And so as we look at uh, across our three different planting dates uh, at a couple different years, uh, the first line there, 20, 2011, you know, the best planting dates were when we were early. Uh, and, and the August planting date, a little bit lower, that was establishment problems. The crop just didn't establish as, as well that year. Uh, the same was true in 2012. At Moscow in 2013, the early planting dates were pretty equivalent, and we didn't have enough moisture left in the fallow by mid-August to actually establish the crop at all in this particular field. And so that goes back to that first slide where the first key to success is establishment. And so you've got to have some moisture there to get the crop growing. 
Um, as we continue to look through the different sites, you know, you, you can see the same story pre pretty much all, all the way through. Pendleton 2013 is another extreme, extreme example of not having enough moisture left to establish the crop. But there was still enough moisture in the profile, even those early planting dates, to keep the crop alive and to allow it to harden off for winter. And so this choice of planting date is really going to vary depending on your climate and your farm and when, and when your rain comes. And so if we all had a crystal ball, we'd know exactly when to plant. But on average, we're finding that, that at least for the higher rainfalls in eastern Washington and northern Idaho, planting on fallow, odds are you're going to do best towards the end of July or 1st of August. So final recommendations. Well, you want to choose an adapted variety, so something that if you do plant early, it's not going to flower and something that's got good winter hardiness. You definitely want to plant into moisture. Um, plant as late as practical, which is the same thing that, that, that was said in the last session uh, in, in, in this room. So you want to be monitoring your soil moisture, so you don't want to wait too long and lose that soil moisture in, in your planting zone. So look at your weather forecast, see what the weather's going, going to be. Try to balance your workload so if you know you're going to be harvesting next week and your field looks like it's okay to plant, it's about the 1st of August, go ahead and plant. Um, but don't plant too late. So we want to have that at least 300 growing degree days to get the plant big enough to survive the winter. Control the insects. Uh, start with the seed treatment. Monitor your crop. Again, you know, with canola, you need to be looking at the crop. So looking at the soil moisture before you plant it, looking at the crop after you plant it, spray it if you need it. But if you do have severe insect damage in your crop in the fall, don't panic because there's a good chance the crop is going to be able to recover. And finally, you want to buy crop insurance. <laughs> All right, so I believe that is... Everything I have. Um, if you have questions, you want to talk to Jack or I next summer, next spring, next fall, feel free to email or call us. We're happy to try to answer your questions and hopefully not steer you in the wrong direction. Uh, please don't bet your farm on our advice. Uh, so with that, we probably have all the computer stuff. So the, the question is commenting on the current conditions of the canola crop. Um, well, it depends on where you're at, and I've seen a lot of variation. Uh, I do know that in central Washington, the fall was pretty dry, and, and there was some crops that didn't establish, uh, and, and because of that, the acres are down. Uh, in northern Idaho, we've, I've seen some winter kill. I was just on the Camas Prairie near Grangeville this last weekend, and there were fields that looked fabulous, and there were fields that looked completely dead. I think it has something to do with their aspect and, 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 and even their growth stage looked like it was about the same. Um, but we had temperatures around zero and no snow cover and high winds. And so those fields that were, I think, more exposed to the wind is where we're seeing the higher desiccation and more winter kill. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's really too early to really make any sort of conclusion until, you know, about the middle of March. Uh, so the question is whether or not the grazing keeps the meristem from elongating. And it does sort of, what happens is the cows eat the growing point off, and then the plant has to regrow from the buds that are near the ground on the stem. So effectively, that keeps the meristem near the ground. And you can accomplish the same thing by mowing. Um, interestingly, that field, the dairy was really interested in grazing some canola and, and reducing their winter feed costs. And so they, they started grazing. They strip grazed. So they put up electric fence, and they would bring the cows out after they milked them in the afternoon, turn them out there at night, and, and they would put them on part of the field. And then they would rotate them to the next part of the field a few days later. And they grazed them, and they grazed them. And, and it got to be about Thanksgiving, and Jack got a phone call. When we, should we take these cows off? Right. A month ago, 
because we wanted to have the crop have a chance to, to regrow uh, before winter. And so get, get them off now, get them off now. And so they took them off. Well, and the dairy operator and the animal science guy took us telling him, move the cows off, actually meant move the cows off and put the sheep on. <laughs> <laughs> and what we ended up with by the end of winter were these little stubs but uh, because there was adequate moisture and it wasn't a terribly hard winter that year, uh, the plants were able to regrow and it flowered a little later than traditional, col uh, traditional canola, but they still got a reasonable crop. It was actually a foundation seed field, so the foundation seed people were real happy that they didn't kill it with the cows. Um, and I saw the same thing in my plots with elk. We had elk move in one winter and all they left was little stems that looked like my thumb. And, and they actually regrew. It wasn't, they didn't yield as well. It probably cost us 25% of our yield due to elk damage. Uh, but given moisture and conditions, it's a pretty tough crop. Our next speaker is Mike Stam from uh, an agronomist at Kansas State University. He runs the, the canola breeding program, which is a winter canola breeding program there. They don't uh, grow spring canolas. But he, he runs the breeding program for the whole lower High Plains region, right? Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. Uh, he's been doing it for quite a while, so he's a, a real resource. This is the second time we've had him out to this oil seeds meeting. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. And we don't have elk damage in Kansas. We have goose damage. I've seen goose just mow canola clear to the ground, and it rebounds, so... Let's see if this thing works. Maybe not. Here we are. Okay, so just kind of to piggyback on what uh, Jim and Bill have covered already, um, some of this you probably uh, have heard in other presentations or heard it mentioned before, um, but there are a lot of factors that affect survival in canola and um, a lot related to variety, whether that variety is adapted or unadapted and you know the reasons we have breeding programs in the PNW and the Southern Great Plains is to develop adapted varieties for the specific climate that we're trying to grow this crop. Uh, varieties can differ, differ in their freeze tolerance and the amount of uh, material or what we call the the soluble substances that it produces in its cells that kind of acts like an antifreeze to help a variety uh, through the winter. It can differ in its ability to acclimate. Uh, it differs in its fall growth characteristics. You've heard us talk about prostrate versus this upright growth habit and how prostrate growth typically helps improve survival. And then there are traits uh, in canola cultivars. There are certain cultivars that don't show fall stem elongation. These are what we call true winter cultivars and we see some differences in some of the material in our program um, that, that avoids uh, fall stem elongation. And then we're also starting to see the semi-dwarfing trait come into some of the hybrids from uh, Europe that we're evaluating now in the U.S. And this trait also helps to keep that crown close and hugging the ground and I think is going to, in the long run, be a, a benefit for winter survival in, in winter canola. Management, uh, Jim's done a really good job of talking about different practices and management and I won't uh, talk a lot about this. I've got a few pictures that show some of this these uh, topics in, in management that illustrate their impact on uh, survival. Um, looking at uh, weather, we all know weather impacts survival. This, these are the low temperatures from the past three growing seasons in uh, Manhattan, Kansas. And this is going to be a little bit hard to see with the different colors, but we've had, really had, uh, over the past three growing seasons, three different uh, patterns of temperatures that have affected survival. Back in, uh, this was 12-13, uh, we had uh, a hard freeze around 28 degrees uh, very early, around the 6th of October, that our canola wasn't in the, the right growth stage uh, to survive, and so we lost some plants because of that. So that getting that top growth is really, uh, really important, and having these early freezes can sometimes be detrimental. Uh, last year uh, was the coldest winter we've had in over a decade in the Southern Plains, and so we had these periods uh, here, long duration periods, more than, than one day, uh, several days, where we had low temperatures around zero. And I think 
Last year was the first year in my 10 years of working with canola where we actually saw a cold temperature kill, where it just got too cold for the, the crop. This year, we've had a, a variation in temperatures. And uh, similar to what Jim was saying, uh, we really didn't have any acclimation time this year. If you look at the, this line in red here, uh, we had one freeze where we got down uh, below 25. And those, those freezing temperatures really helped this crop acclimate. Uh, but we went from one freeze here down to uh, around 10 degrees uh, in a matter of a couple of weeks. And uh, just really no acclimation time for that crop to harden off uh, to withstand these cold temperatures. And so we've seen some kill already because of this November freeze. Then we peaked back up, uh, low temperatures in the 40s, and then we went back down here uh, towards uh, the new year uh, where we had these really low temperatures. And that kind of finished off some of this canola that was really impacted by this cold spell uh, in November. And then when I left to come out here, it was 67 degrees. So it's just this constant roller coaster of temperatures that impacts this crop. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a few pictures now of uh, a grower that's kind of pushing the limits for winter canola in Kansas. This is a guy in, in north central Kansas. And um, this last year was his first year of growing canola. And I'd say he was pretty successful because he had one of the highest yielding dryland uh, fields in the state. Um, but it was quite a year for him to try canola for the first time because of this cold winter and being in an area uh, that typically has colder nights, uh, colder winter temperatures than in the southern part of the state where most of the canola is grown. Uh, but his production practices are also a little bit different. He's using wide rows, uh, using uh, vertical tillage to break up his uh, residue. And um, he was using Roundup Ready varieties uh, last year. This is uh, the high class 115 variety. And I just want to kind of illustrate what this crop looked like over the, the growing season. This is uh, March 13th of 2014, and this is um, after you know, several rounds of freezing temperatures. By this time, you should be able to row this crop. It should be greening up, uh, but we weren't there yet. If you I'll go back, uh, if you went and looked in the row, you could see several plants that had frozen out. Uh, these bigger plants uh, were fairly few and far between, uh, but they survived the winter. Look at the crop on April 10th, a month later, and it really hadn't greened back up. It was just, you could just start to row it. We had a very cold March, and that also uh, set the crop back in its uh, recovery. But if you looked at some of those dead plants, you actually saw green leaf tissue growing out of the stem. Uh, this can be a benefit and it can be a problem. Uh, the problem is these uh, leaves that come on late uh, from this stem tissue are generally later maturing. And so what you see here on May 28th is we see crop here that grew from that stem tissue or that root tissue that's just starting to bolt. You have plants that are setting pods that are going towards ripening, and then you have plants that are in full bloom. So that makes for uh, some issues at harvest, uh, to say the least. Um, but this producer went ahead and desiccated and direct cut his canola. It was in the 20 uh, to 30 bushel range, around 28 bushel probably average. Uh, however, with those later maturing um, pods and uh, plants at, through that uh, time period, his oil content was very low. So it, we're talking around 25% or so because those seeds that developed were practically hollow. They really didn't develop a germ, which is where the, the oil is, is located in the seed. Um, so it illustrates the fact that we want each one of those plants uh, to survive. We want the most winter hardy varieties that we can we can get so that all those, uh, those plants survive and you don't have these issues with uh, this uh, regrowth. Even though it could be a benefit, it could, uh, it could, event it could produce a crop, uh, it's not gonna be the highest yielding crop by any stretch. And these pictures may be hard to see in this slide, uh, but this is, again, a, a location in Kansas that's pushing the limits of adaptability in the state, a north central Kansas location. Uh, just illustrating some of our varieties uh, that we've developed over the years and 
the regrowth that we're seeing following uh, this very cold period of, of temperatures last year. This KS4549 is a conventional variety that we're hoping to release and in my variety trials this year, especially in the national trial in Manhattan, this is the, about the only variety that's alive currently because of that November freeze uh, and that cold stretch that we had around the new year. Uh, this is a, a true winter type that has a very tight uh, rosette. And again, this is going to be hard to see, but there are green plants out here. Uh, just two examples of some new varieties and the new traits that I was talking about with the semi-dwarf hybrids. Uh, Mercedes is a hybrid that's uh, been grown in the PNW or being tested in the PNW that appears to have very good uh, winter hardiness uh, from Rubisco seeds. And this DK Sensei is a, a hybrid from Monsanto from Europe. It's one of their popular semi-dwarf hybrids. And again, I think that having that semi-dwarfing trait where it holds the growing point close to the soil surface is again going to be uh, a key trait, uh, especially if we continue to bring more of these uh, hybrids into the U.S. And just showing some survival data with some uh, varieties that are grown in your PNW trials and also in the national trial. This is across five locations in the Great Plains that had differential winter kill last year. Uh, showing the benefit of the, the breeding program and our, our varieties having a better survival score uh, than some of the varieties that aren't um, necessarily adapted or but have been uh, brought in uh, from other breeding programs. And Wichita was the one of the first winter canola varieties released out of our program that uh, for our region really set the, the standard for winter hardiness and uh, now we have material that is even showing improved um, hardiness over the Wichita variety. And then finish off with some slides showing some of the management uh, issues we've struggled with. Uh, heavy residue uh, can be very detrimental to survival uh, in winter canola. This is uh, in very minimal disturbance no-till. Uh, in these pictures here on this uh, producer's farm, we've learned that we have to move the residue out of the seed row to provide uh, some bare soil around those plants. Uh, to help radiate some of that, that soil uh, heat uh, throughout the day. Otherwise, with that residue there, it buffers the temperature and, and uh, we see uh, issues with winter kill. This is showing uh, 1x residue. This is where we actually removed the residue and moved it over to this plot to have two times the residue. Uh, but what a little bit of tillage and actually burning the residue and then no tilling into uh, can do to improve survival. Another illustration of residue management and how important it is, this is, a, uh, this is actually a producer's field that, where he no-tilled uh, canola into very high corn uh, residue. And this residue actually, he moved it, but it blew back uh, basically the same day into the uh, field. And here the plants uh, snaked through the residue and where that little plant finally finds light once it snakes through that residue, that's where it sets the crown. And when it does that, we see extreme elongation of the hypocotyl. And this is very detrimental. Uh, this is, again, this is where the crown is. This is where the soil surface was be. Um, this plant snaked through four inches or more of residue. And uh, this is an instant recipe for, for winter kill when that uh, crown is elevated so high above the soil surface and on the residue. And this is that same field following that uh, very cold November temperatures that we experienced. This is what I would call fall kill. It's not winter kill. Uh, but here we're seeing uh, several effects. We're seeing an excessive seeding rate where we're having too much competition among the plants. And we're, we saw the extreme cold, but then we're also seeing the inadequate residue removal where we're not getting that residue moved and, and um, held between uh, the rows of canola. And just another illustration of that uh, stem elongation, here's the soil surface down here, here's the crown of the plant. We still have green tissue down here at the soil surface. Now it's a question of whether or not this plant is going to survive and regrow if this crown freezes off. Uh, there's a possibility that it could survive. I highly doubt it after the, the uh, early January temperatures that we had. Um, but it's 
It's very interesting to me that this crop basically can regrow from its root or its stem below the soil surface when we freeze off or mow off all of this above ground residue or above ground uh, growth. Uh, I mentioned the excessive seeding rate in that other slide. I think this is an area that we're we're going to focus some attention uh, because I believe some of our producers are overseeding canola and we're getting too much competition uh, in, in our fields. And if you look at the, the literature from uh, the European growers of oilseed rape, their uh, expected final plant population is around 30 to 40 plants per meter squared, which is not very many. Um, this is primarily in the, the kind of the Baltic regions of uh, the EU where they, um, they have very similar winters to what we experience in the Southern Great Plains. Uh, but this is DK4410 planted at two different seeding rates uh, in Manhattan. This picture was taken on the 4th of uh, December. And you can see quite a striking difference in color between the two. Uh, this is a, a Roundup Ready variety that I would consider is a very winter hardy and does uh, extremely well uh, in this climate. Uh, so we have seeding rate studies now um, looking at cultivar by seeding rate uh, interaction effects as well as uh, seeding rate by row spacing interaction effects. And I think we're going to learn a lot uh, from this study uh, this year in particular in how uh, we're seeing a benefit by reducing um, the seeding rate and, and seeing better uh, survival on those lower seeding rates. And in Kansas, we typically don't have to plant early to get excessive fall growth. This is a variety trial planted in, again, north central Kansas, planted on the 4th of September, and we have over almost two feet of fall growth on October 10th. Just a very open uh, fall last year and lots of, of moisture to help uh, push this crop along. And if you look at the different varieties or different classes of varieties, uh, this is an illustration of, again, of holding that growing point closer to the soil surface and how it might benefit winter survival. Looking at a conventional hybrid from Europe, uh, this orange stake here would be the soil surface, and then the, these red arrows are pointing to where the growing point is currently uh, when, this, uh, when I pulled these plants out of the field. And you can see around two to three inches of, of fall stem elongation. Uh, for us, this fall stem elongation is a recipe for winter kill unless you go out and you remove that, that meristem tissue uh, like Jim was talking about, but uh, producers typically aren't going to do that in our region. You can see our breeding material uh, <coughs> typically holds that crown very close to the ground. We've selected for a prostrate growth habit. And then these semi-dwarfing hybrids that I've mentioned also have the ability to keep that crown tight uh, to the ground. And these are actually in uh, plots that I would say I, I've overseeded. I tend to overseed material a little bit to push the selection pressure somewhat so we can select those varieties that do tend to hug, hug that uh, growing point uh, closer to the ground. Um, after this year though, I think I'm going to reduce my seeding rates and take the advice that I give to, to growers uh, that maybe they should consider reducing that seeding rate a little bit and not overseed uh, to reduce the competition and improve their chances of uh, winter survival. And just some data illustrating from a, a three-year study in Manhattan that planting early does uh, generally, or what we would consider early, uh, mid to late August to mid-September uh, benefits both survival and yield in winter can canola. If we plant canola like we do winter wheat, it's not generally going to yield or survive very well. Important thing to remember as well, Jim kind of alluded to this, uh, know the varieties that you're planting. Uh, some of the hybrids that are currently being grown are uh, winter by spring crosses, and that generally creates what we call a facultative winter. It's not a, a true winter. This is a variety that was planted uh, in September in south central Kansas. This photo was taken on the, uh, the 25th of November, had over eight inches of stem long elongation, and it was already bolting. It was producing buds. Uh, and this field was going to winter kill out uh, because of that. So. Uh, ask your seed reps, ask your university um, researchers and extension uh, people about the varieties that you're, you're wanting to grow on your farm, especially if you're going to grow winter canola because uh, we don't want to be growing something that's a facultative winter uh, in our environment. 
And to me, the elevated crown and canola, if you have that excessive seeding rate um, and a variety that's prone to stem elongation, that often equals winter kill. Or if it doesn't equal winter kill, it's going to equal delayed maturity, weak stems, lodging, and reduced yield. And we don't want any of that uh, if we're growing winter canola. We want something that is going to hug the ground. That crown is going to stay winter, or excuse me, stay green uh, throughout the winter. And then uh, once spring dormancy uh, breaks, it's going to rapidly uh, develop and stem along gate and bolt and go on to producing uh, the seed and oil that uh, makes us the money. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. And if you would like to contact me about anything related to canola varieties, I'd be uh, very happy to visit with you. The semi-dwarfs, um, this is the second year I believe I've evaluated them. So I really haven't had an, an opportunity to see it in a, in a very high yielding environment. Uh, they say that this, the semi-dwarfs will stay about chest high maximum. Some of them, there's some differences in the, the semi-dwarf trait in, in certain backgrounds. And so some of the semi-dwarfs you see the benefit more in the fall in, in its ability to hold that, that growing point closer to the ground. Others you see the benefit of keeping, of reducing the height of the crop. Um, so the, the verdict's still out in our region about how tall they're actually gonna be. If, I'm curious to see how they perform in a very high yielding environment to see if they'll be the same height as conventional canola. Okay, the last speaker in our group is Curtis Hennings, the only farmer in the group. Uh, I put him last so he could correct any misconceptions made by these more academic types. He's a, he's a grower uh, south of Ritzville area, and he's been uh, in, a, in a low rainfall area, and he's been growing oilseed crops, canola, and others for quite a long time now. So, I've been, I've been at this game since 1984, it was first year. It was actually winter rapeseed, not winter canola. We didn't have canola here at the time. Well, we pretty much destroyed that market because that's a real thin market, and the price of rapeseed went from seven and a half cents down to two cents if you can find somebody to take it off your hands. So, but, so we switched to canola. This year was a, just a good one to slap me around and tell me that I've lied to most of you folks that know me all along because. I had never lost a well-established winter canola crop in all those 30 years until this year. Part of the problem, this last fall, not this fall, fall before, I had the most ideal seeding conditions I had ever had. I had rain, it was wet, I, I'd made the comment, God, I feel like an irrigated farmer. Finally, 3.3 pounds per acre, way too many plants because every stinking one of them came. As attested to some of Mike's slides there. And it grew so well that the growing point left the soil surface. And I lost two, I should have taken out the third field because they, they just took off and grew. But I know time's kind of short here. The decision process that I usually went through was anything after the 27th of July was safe for winter canola. Bar a winter by spring cross that Dick Ald put out years ago called Cascade. And you had to be careful with that one. You had to wait later because it would want to, some of the plants in the population would want to bolt in the summertime. But to, I, to, fertility, I think, fertility by soil moisture by date is pretty much, I'm, I'm throwing this third aspect into this because if I'd remembered some of the things that I'd learned over time, I remember seeing an abstract from, I think it was a 1993 International Rapeseed Congress. 
the, the Poles from Poland had a lot of trouble with winter survival or winter kill. But it wasn't really winter kill, it was spring kill. And uh, they'd been putting on most all their fertilizer, if not all of it, pre-plant. And it would, the plants would then bolt earlier in the spring. And I've seen this myself. The ends of a field that are double fertilized will always break dormancy earlier than the rest of the field by a significant amount. This last year, I had all my fertility on ahead of time. I had beautiful growing conditions. The fall was long. It was just a recipe for disaster, even though I thought I was sitting in Fat City when I started out. So, I, and I'll agree with another comment that up until the 5th or 6th of September in my area, I know everybody's area is different, up till then you're fairly safe. Anything I've seeded after that, half of it never made the winter because it wasn't well established enough. Usually we look for a, like a six true leaf plant and I'm looking for comments or agreements on that. At least a six true leaf plant to make good winter hardiness. You can have great big plants, but as long as the, you haven't planted too early that the growing point leaves the soil surface. I actually, and see, I thought I was safe. I, I've had years where mid-August planting, 20 below zero, no snow cover. There was not a speck of green out there this spring. Actually, the leaves were so desiccated, it didn't even look near as good as Mike's slides did with dead foliage out there. But soil thawed out, go out, dig up a plant, cut into the stem. Even if a quarter of it was white, not green, but white, it would put up a new plant. So like I said, I thought I was safe, but it's really, you just need to get back to, you've got ideal conditions, wait. It goes against our nature to wait but don't plant the very end of July or beginning of August in. Uh, most of you folks here are from Washington, aren't you? Or, anyway, but if you get a little further south, you're a little safer because your season's a little longer and milder, but usually beginning of August to the 6th of September is kind of a safe range, but just, just be careful it's not too ideal because that'll bite you. And I apologize to everybody I lied to all these years. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll repeat the question for the, Thanks. the, the video. Uh, so the question is if, if planting date in the fall affects flowering time in the spring. And sometimes it does, and, and, and it, it will affect it in different ways. I've seen it when if you planted later, it flowered later just because the plants were smaller and they weren't quite as vigorous coming out of the spring. And then in the slides that I showed today, the early planted material flowered later because it had more winter damage and it took it longer to recover in the spring. So it can go either way or it can not make any difference at all. So it depends <laughs> is the answer. Uh, it's probably not that easy because there's a balance between management and uh, I mean, you could you could plant a, a ground hugging variety wrong, and it could show stem elongation. Um, but if you do things, if you treat them like you should, if you manage them well, then there shouldn't be any problems. I I would think so. Uh, is Tom Tom Poole in the room? I saw some picture from Tom Poole's place up in the Mansfield area, and he, had, he put down fertilizer at the time of planting, but had a distance from the plant so he didn't hurt it. But it got into that, and I forget what his planting date was. It was relatively late, and he had huge plants in the fall. So I really, that, that riddle get into it. I, I think it would be still a recipe for disaster. That's just my opinion. Uh, have you guys experimented with growth regulators? This is the first year that we've actually tried uh, some growth regulators. And it's a very common practice in uh, Europe 
they plant early when soil moisture is available and then uh, most of their um, fungicides that they use actually have a little bit of a, a growth regulating benefit to them as well so that's uh, and they're putting that fungicide on to basically control black leg uh, in the fall so it it's a very common practice um, in the EU and Europe and so I think it's something that um, we definitely need to investigate further so this year we put out our first study. I know Oklahoma State has put out some studies with winter canola uh, as well, looking at different growth regulators, uh, but we don't have any data on that. Um, and uh, as far as the, the best management practices for those go, we don't have any uh, experience as well. So we're kind of working on those. Of, uh, and by best management practices, I mean the rate and the timing uh, we also know that uh, the year, it's kind of year dependent on how well they behave or how, how effective the growth regulator uh, is. So uh, there's a lot to be learned there, but it's definitely something I think could benefit us and something that we'd like to have in our toolbox to grow this crop.